Hello and welcome back to the Crew Motorfest. Now in this video, we're going to be diving right back in to this early access gameplay, which I want to give a massive thank you to the developers once again for allowing me to check this game out. Now in this video, we're going to be doing a deeper dive, a deeper gameplay look into the Made in Japan playlist, which was one of my favorites out of the ones that they showed. Now obviously, the icon car that we are seeing throughout this gameplay is going to be this gorgeous wide-body A80 Toyota Supra. However, there are some really, really beautiful cars that we are going to be seeing, like that FDR X7, the Evo 10, the R34 GTR, the NSX, the ND Miata, and we will actually be driving that Evo 10 a little bit later on in this video. So if you want to see gameplay of the Evo 10, make sure you stick around for that. Now, I absolutely love the visual style of this playlist and the visual style that they went for in this kind of series of events, or rather in this playlist of events because not only does it set the tone, but I think it also speaks to someone like me that grew up playing the racing games of the early 2000s and then into the mid-2000s that really leaned into this very visual style. So what does it feel like to drive something like an A80 Supra in the Crew Motorfest as opposed to driving something like the Lamborghini Revuelto that we saw in my last video about this game? And to be honest, the cars really do seem to have their own unique handling style, especially something like this, which is a lot more likely to not only get the tail out mid-corner and especially on corner exit, but it really does seem to feel and drive like something that draws a lot of its power from the fact that it's turbocharged. I mean, a lot of cars from this era leaned heavily into turbocharging, and especially in the JDM space, and I think it definitely comes through when you drive these cars. Now, obviously, this is a arcade racer, and you can feel that in the physics when you drive it. However, I think it does a really good job of providing that, you know, that level of accessibility, but also providing a level of depth that feels fun to use and honestly makes the cars really fun to drive. And I think that if you came from, say, something like the Crew 2, you're going to have even more fun driving the cars in the Crew Motorfest. I certainly did. And right back there, you can absolutely get the tail out smoothly and kind of maintain a little bit of a slide if you want to. And I'm sure that once we are able to start playing around with the assists and the traction control settings a little bit more, we'll be able to find the limits and dynamics of these cars much, much easier. And I'm really looking forward to doing that later on. Now, continuing through this race, I was trying to play around a little bit with the handling of the car, trying to get the tail end out a little bit more. And as you can see, when it does happen, it's very progressive. It's very, uh, it's not snappy at all, which I really, really like because not only, again, does it make the handling of these cars very accessible, but it also makes it really, really fun. You can adjust the car at the limit with the throttle or with the momentum that you carry into a corner, but it also doesn't feel like the car is going to bite you at any random time or back itself into a wall. It doesn't feel like it's going to ever snap on you. It just feels nice and smooth and approachable, which I think is not only really, really important for a game like this, but also makes the cars a genuine good time to drive and a genuine good time to use. I had an absolute blast in these races. I really, really did. Now, in terms of sounds, not only do I think that the car itself sounded really good, but I really liked the sounds of the backfires on some of the shifts, as well as the sound of the boost function. And I also like the visuals of the boost. The boost doesn't necessarily seem like it's massive or over the top, but it also, you know, it's very clearly there, and you can obviously tell that you're using it, but it doesn't, you know, overtake the entire screen or overtake the entire experience in a way that takes away from anything else. I think it actually is a really, really nice setup, especially visually, and I find it really, really satisfying, and it once again takes me back to the early and mid-2000s racing games that had Boost as a gameplay dynamic, and it actually kind of makes me really nostalgic to see that in a game from this era that looks this good and plays this smooth, but we're driving cars that, you know, I looked up to as a kid, you know, like, I looked up to cars like the A80 Supra when I was really, really young, and now driving these cars in a racing game today with all of the visual aspects of modern racing games, 
it's really, really interesting, I think, to look at from the perspective of someone that grew up looking up at these cars, even when I was really, really young. But, you know, nostalgia aside, what it does for this game, I think, is it not only keeps these cars preserved, but it also, I think, does a really good job of reintroducing these cars to people that might not be super, super familiar with them yet. I mean, obviously, there are going to be so many people out there that know the A80 Supra, but at the same time, you know, there are some people that, you know, they, they were born long after the A80 Supra came out, and you never know, a game like this might be the game that introduces them to a car like, the, for example, this one, or some of the other cars in, that we see in these races. Like, for example, the Eclipse. The Eclipse was another car that, for, for me anyway, from my era, it was definitely one of those cars where you would see one, especially one that was set up really nice and really clean, and you'd be like, holy crap, that's a sick Eclipse. Now, continuing on, look at that freaking S2000. I love that thing, but that's not the focus of this race. The focus of this race is this Evo 10, this gorgeous wide body Evo 10 with crazy aero, crazy graphics, wild looking wheels, and an absolutely enormous wing. The wing on this thing is, it, it, it's enormous. It's absolutely freaking massive. Now, driving this car, was definitely a very different experience from driving the Supra. Now, it wasn't different necessarily in the way of it felt like a different game or anything like that, but you could absolutely feel that dynamically you were driving a different car with a different type of drivetrain, a different type of engine setup, a different type of, you know, turbo setup. The car performed distinguishably differently than the other one. And I want to make that clear because I think sometimes, you know, what we see from people that will criticize games like this one, for example, is they're like, oh, well, you know, the, the, the there's not enough variance between this car to this car and not enough, like, unique feel. And, you know, obviously, again, this is an arcade racer for sure, but the cars do a really good job of keeping that unique feel between each other. Now, obviously, the overall physics system that all of these cars are built around is, you know, that's the same physics system, but I think they really have done a great job at preserving the uniqueness of the cars. Because again, as you can see with this Evo, we are not sliding around anywhere near as much, but when it dives into a corner, especially if you get the front end positioned correctly on the way into the corner, you can get a little bit of rotation out of it, but whereas in the Supra, where we were getting a lot of mid-corner and corner exit rotation on throttle, this Evo, we're getting a little bit of that, but mostly what we're getting is rotation on corner entry under braking and under loading up of the front end, which I think is an important distinction to make because, you know, that's one of those distinct differences that you see between, say, for example, a front-engine rear-wheel drive car or a front-engine all-wheel drive car like this one, whereas, you know, in the real world, for example, you know, you could make these cars handle however you wanted if you changed up diff settings or sway bars or coilovers, whatever the case may be, but... I think, you know, having that, having those distinct handling differences between the cars really goes a long way in allowing you to develop your own driving style and your own driving preferences built around the cars that you genuinely like. Now, let me know in the comment section down below what you thought of this gameplay and particularly what you thought of the stylistic approach that they went for in the Made in Japan playlist. I personally really, really dig it. I think it's, I think it's definitely a unique take on events like this, and I think it works Works really really well within the world of the game but again I am going to of course open the floor to y'all to let me know your own opinions in the comments down below because I really want to have a discussion about y'all's feelings about this game leading up of course to this game's release which I am super super excited about I am absolutely going to be spending time in this game and I truly can't wait to explore more of what this game has to offer it's gonna be an absolute freaking blast and yes, I overcooked that last corner quite a bit, but I kind of sort of redeemed myself on this one. Not really, but kind of sort of. And either way, once again, let me know any thoughts and opinions that y'all may have in that comment section down below. But that is going to do it for this video. I had an absolute blast bringing this gameplay of the Crew Motorfest to y'all. 
And with that, I'll see y'all in the next one. This was the Nitu Lancer Evo X with a special Toji custom. And you just showed you're totally worthy of that car.